Arc believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that Arc believes to be reliable. However, Arc does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from Arc. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on Arc's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements. Will Hershey, thank you for joining us today on the FYI podcast. Uh, we're here to talk about online gambling, so I'm just going to open up the floor to you. What is the current state of online gambling? Where are we today? And where are we going tomorrow? That's a lot. I might need to, I might need to take that in bite-sized pieces. But no, uh, Nicholas, thank you again for, again for having me, right? I think I was on with you a little bit over a year ago now, pre-pandemic. Crazy how the world and the markets and everything have changed since. In terms of online gambling, where we are now um, in the U.S., and I think maybe it's helpful to give a little bit of context in terms of how we got here. So um, if you kind of look back uh, historically in terms of the gaming market, um, you know, it's evolved significantly over the years, always been kind of seen as a a tax revenue generator for states uh, and for local governments. Um, I think a lot of people think of uh, Nevada and most specifically Las Vegas is kind of having a, a foothold in, in the gambling market. And that's certainly been true, more or less excluding a, a handful of other states that were kind of grandfathered in and their kind of own different ways, including New Jersey. But really how we kind of got to where we are today um, all started with uh, the repeal of PASPA uh, in 2018, uh, in May of 2018. And really what we saw there um, was without getting into kind of the legalese and details where I'm probably way over my skis, Basically, what that did was it made mobile sports betting, and more specifically, it made sports betting legal uh, at the federal level. I'm not sure how many people appreciate that, but sports betting is legal according to the federal U.S. government. Um, And now it has become uh, a state-by-state issue uh, for state legislatures to determine how they want to approach the market, how they want to tax it, how they want to regulate it. And as a result, it becomes kind of important to understand that every state's different and really the devil is really in the details here. In terms of the the current market, so 2018, the floodgates were opened. Um, New Jersey was the first state to kind of uh, really embrace um, mobile sports betting. Currently, uh, the U.S. market is still very nascent. We're, pardon the pun here, but we are in the early innings of the U.S. online gambling rollout, including sports betting and and iGaming, which is kind of this broader definition of of online casino and internet gambling. Right now, the markets in in terms of revenue somewhere around the $1 billion mark um, for sports betting uh, within the U.S. It's about a billion and a half in terms of revenues uh, on the iGaming side. I don't know if people appreciate how big that uh, opportunity is. And when you look at it on a state-by-state basis, we're live in about a little less than it's changing almost day by day. We're in, in roughly we're live in roughly half of the states in terms of sports betting. Um, less than that, so somewhere around 15, 16 have legalized online betting. So as we go through all this details at state by state level, very very different. That being said, you know where we are right today is we're kind of seeing an acceleration in terms of states embracing, uh, particularly online sports betting as a way to bring in tax revenues in the wake of, of COVID-19 and, and what we've seen in terms of budget deficits. I think Goldman was out with a report just a couple of weeks ago that highlighted uh, you know, state budget uh, shortfalls are the highest they've ever been measured in the tens of billions of dollars. I don't know the exact number, but state by state, we just saw Wyoming uh, legalized. They're, they just legalized only online betting. Um, Maryland is, is, is at the finish line. New York, the big one that everyone's been waiting on, feels like we just got, we have a deal. Uh, the details still need to work out. But this is all to say that you know, since the repeal passed, but it's become a state-by-state issue, uh, and, and more and more states are, are embrace, embracing the model. When you look at it on kind of a percentage of the population basis, roughly a quarter of all Americans now have access to online sports betting, uh, somewhere around 10 uh, for for iGaming. And when I, when I look at, you know, those, those market numbers, you know, a billion and a billion five, um, it shows how early we are. Because when you look at, you know, and, and the data on this is very difficult because much of the wagering that's taking place within the U.S. and, and even globally, for that matter, is taking place uh, via unregulated offshore sports books. And, and the question is, how much of that is going to matriculate and make its way into this regulated market? Um, we really, really don't know. 
Um, but, uh, you know, to give you one one data point, uh, you know, the Super Bowl, I think everyone likes to point to as one of the bigger sporting, you know, sporting events of, of the year. The Super Bowl, we saw, let's call it 500 million in regulated wagers. The estimates are, are as high as five to 10 billion in terms of unregulated. So there's a huge opportunity here. We're in the early innings. That's kind of the state of the union uh, for the market right now. So we have a lot of kind of tailwinds for online gambling. The one main factor seeming to be kind of the legalization and the revenue opportunity for states. But then I guess on the consumer side, right, this is a way to bring a convenient, uh, monetizable, uh, more enjoyable, more enjoyable experience for consumers to kind of engage with their favorite sports teams or, you know, watch their favorite game and, you know, make it a little more interesting, so to speak. Um just taking a step back, though, you had mentioned iGaming, sports wagering, and I assume esports falls into that. Then there's fantasy, right? Like, what are the kind of main buckets? Is that the kind of best way to understand it? So you have iGaming, and then sports gambling, and then where does fantasy play into that at all? Like, how should how should investors be thinking of online gambling as a as a total kind of term? I think that's absolutely right. Those are the the three buckets, and those are the three buckets because. They're kind of being treated differently from a, from a regulation standpoint. So when you look at, let's start with kind of the lowest hanging fruit is, is daily fantasy. And I think in a lot of ways, the success that FanDuel and DraftKings had uh, with daily fantasy, which, you know, under the rule of law is considered, you know, depending on where you are, is considered really a game of skill. And in that sense, it doesn't fall under the same regulatory framework and and as a result was able to kind of get off the ground much earlier than the repeal of PASPA. So DraftKings and FanDuel were around well before that. Um, You know, daily fantasy uh, is legal in 40 plus states and, you know, I think is is a lot lower hanging fruit for for states to bring on board. That being said, from a market opportunity perspective, you know, first of all, it's it's very much so dominated by those two players. It's FanDuel and it's DraftKings. You know, you have others, you have Monkey Knife Fight that Bally's just bought. Um, a few other players out there, but it's very top heavy. When I look at daily fantasy from market opportunity, it's really, I believe, not much else beyond customer acquisition. And, you know, the whole idea as we go through this, the whole idea is daily fantasy is a way to get a user on board, move them up to higher margin business opportunities, first in sports book, and then further on in, into iGaming. Um, touching on those, so sports betting, uh, we touched on where it's legal, 20 plus states, legal to federal level, going to be a state issue to figure out how that gets rolled out. I think the expectation is we eventually get towards full legalization. Few states that are going to be really, really tricky, Hawaii, Utah in particular, you know, we'll see what happens there. And then, you know, in terms of the the market opportunity, um, you know, sports betting, we can touch on this, the size of that later, but I think is a, is a much larger uh, pie, certainly than, than daily fantasy but these are, these are opportunities measured in, in tens of billions of dollars in, in terms of gross gaming revenue. Then you move on to iGaming, which is online casino. So that includes online slots, online blackjack, some of which is like purely digital. If you've ever like played like, you know, blackjack uh, on an electronic machine, some of which is now being done via, you know, live casino games where you're actually interacting with, um, you know, real cards being dealt, which I think is a pretty interesting technology. iGaming... And coming back to sports betting, sports betting gets all the headlines because it's fun. It's exciting. You touched on it. It's a way to kind of, you know, interact with your favorite teams that you love and and has a nice story to it. I believe that iGaming is truly the long term, you know, most revenue generative potential out of everything here. You know, that being said, um, you know, iGaming is the trickiest from a state legislation perspective. We're only in about, you know, 10, 10 or so states. I think states view it as kind of a moral and ethical issue more so than than sports betting. But that's kind of the those are the three buckets. I think sports betting and, and iGaming, depending on who you ask, are are you know the two biggest opportunities. I think the only thing that's really going to hold iGaming back, and, and just to give you context, we're already seeing in states like New Jersey, iGaming is bringing in more tax revenue already than sports betting. You just don't hear about it because it's not it's not particularly sexy to talk about you know Will Hershey playing online blackjack. It's like no one cares. But that's kind of the lay of the land. And I think, um, you know, iGaming really is that that long tail opportunity that's maybe not talked about as much. Got it. And yeah, maybe we won't touch on iGaming as much because I do want to keep it specific to online sports betting. And then just when we when we think about online sports betting, right, you had thrown out the number. It's around one billion dollars in total revenue. 
and that's off a base of how much being actually gambled. And I understand that term. You said, you know, total total wagers. I also hear the term handle, right? As that that's the other way to kind of say that figure. Um, how much of you know in in 2020, a year where sports were pretty much decimated, like probably one of the worst year for actual sports viewing and playing of sports, you know, the, the Super Bowl number of you know, figures around viewing were down, college football championship, national championship viewing was down, you had shortened seasons. And yet I still saw figures out there saying online sports wagering and gambling was growing. So how much in total wagering do you have that figure for 2020? Yeah, so I think it's really important to talk through these different uh, terms because they, they get used around a ton. And when we're talking about these huge numbers, it's like, you know, it's important to you know manage expectations, but also understand how big this opportunity really is. I don't have the exact number for 2020 on handle. What I can tell you is a, a good rule of thumb for sports betting, and I'm going to throw out another term, is that the sports book will the sports book will typically hold. Meaning, if you bet $100, the hold is the percentage of that $100 over the you know over time that the sports book will bring in as as kind of uh, revenue. Meaning you know, what the sports book's winning versus what they're what they're losing. That's kind of their edge. Typically, that will come in, uh, you know, between five to eight percent. So if you kind of want to think about, you know, for every hundred dollars wagered, the sports book is probably going to bring in revenue somewhere between five to eight dollars. You can kind of back into, you know, what that means for that that one billion dollar mark. But you're but you're absolutely right. Like even in a year when, you know, the sports calendar was totally messed up, we saw tremendous, tremendous growth in, in these, these sports book operators. And I think that uh, like a large part of the growth in the, in the short to inter intermediate term here is simply coming from these states coming online. You know, that is going to show a lot of top line growth for a lot of these operators. Yeah. I, I always see the numbers around revenue. And then I think people forget sometimes that's just a percentage, right? That five to 8% of total, total wagering. Um, so the actual money changing hands here is a lot larger than, than most people are thinking about. Um, and it gets even smaller when it trickles down from company revenue to actual tax revenue for states. And those are oftentimes the numbers actually being reported, not total wagering or handle figures. I think those often get shrouded in kind of the, the news. Um, changing kind of the tone here, in terms of you know, which states and maybe which companies are kind of rolling out in, in maybe a more efficient and easier manner, manner, right? You talked about kind of each state has the opportunity now to, to roll out online sports betting and online gambling in different ways. Is there kind of a, a state that people should be looking to as, ah, that's the one that kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, it, it, it rolled out everything perfectly. Uh, and it's, you know, a, a, a blossoming market in that state. And then who within that state at a company level should people be paying attention to? And then we can get maybe into the more kind of nitty gritty of the actual like mobile apps and, and what's happening there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I'll start with what I think first, which state didn't get it right and what, what not to do, which is one example here. Well, you could you could point to DC and what they've done. They're actually running it through the state lottery, which is a huge disaster. Oregon is doing something similar. They're not even making money. This is the state trying to run it and shows how important it is for the, you know, these operators that have the technology, that have the know-how to run a sports book. Let the let the kind of free market of who actually knows how to make run these as profitable businesses do it. But the other I'd point to is what we've seen in New Hampshire uh, of what not to do, which is where it's a state-run system. They selected, you know, they did an RFP. They selected one operator in DraftKings to run the the entire model, uh, whereby the state, I believe, collects 51% of those gross gaming revenues in the form of taxes. Sounds great for DraftKings, and maybe it will be, uh, depending on the price they paid versus what they're able to earn over the lifetime of, of that deal. But the, the whole big thing here that we keep talking about is, you know, there are so much in the way of unregulated wagers that are going to make their way into the market. If you don't create a competitive environment where people can go see what is the spread on this sports book, what's the line on this sports book, you know, really creating competitive offering uh, without that framework, I think you're likely to see individuals, particularly the more savvy sports bettors out there, continue to bet through a bookie, continue to bet through, you know, these black market uh, sports books. So I think really, really important to kind of create a, a competitive market. And I think almost everyone would agree that the best example of that thus far um, has to be New Jersey. 
where each casino has basically been granted three licenses with the which they're then licensing out to, to various operators. You know, New Jersey has dozens of operators. It is still kind of dominated and, and, and very top heavy on the sports betting side. Um, but really what they've done there is create a plethora of options for, you know, the end users, depending on what they're looking for, what type of bets they're trying to place, how they look at pricing to really create the best customer experience. And it, and it has resulted in meaningful tax revenues for the state of New Jersey. So that's the model that I would say everyone's looking to as this is kind of the gold standard for how this can be rolled out in terms of who the leaders are um, in New Jersey. Uh, and this is going to be consistent. Uh, it's really, it's once again, it's DraftKings, it's FanDuel. And then, you know, I think what you're going to start to see is kind of this big four that emerges on a state by state basis, which includes those two at the very, very top. And they're kind of fighting for pole position, uh, you know, at a, at a uh, country level within the U.S. And then you have BetMGM, which is a JV between Entain and MGM. And then finally, you have the dark horse in, you know, Barstool, Penn National uh, and that marketing machine. So those, I think, are the big four kind of the, to pay attention to at least for right now. But once again, state by state issues, like very, there's nuances almost in every state here. And so when we break it down to the to the company level and, and actually get into kind of how these wagers are placed and how these operators are building out the experience for consumers, what in your opinion has been kind of the go-to strategy for not only rollout, but uh, kind of gaining consumer interest in your sport, sports book versus a competitor, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, you're placing a wager and you can do that across any book. You can do it offshore, right? I'm not that we're recommending to do that. That's illegal, but you can't, right? It doesn't change, you know, that much in terms of the actual mechanism of, of, of betting on a sport. Um, so what in that is like happening and changing? Like how are these competitors trying to differentiate themselves from your opinion? Yeah. I mean, I think at the very highest level, um, like you have to highlight the capital that's being allocated towards marketing and advertising by these firms. I mean, as with most kind of nascent B2C businesses uh, or, or sectors, you know, that's simply a large part of the name of the game early on. And it's how many eyeballs can you, you know, and, and I think FanDuel and DraftKings are in the pole position here once again, because we talked about it. They have these large databases from their daily fantasy users that they can, can then convert. But a big part of it in terms of how, you know, users are, are being attracted to certain platforms is simply marketing dollars. Uh, you know, if you look at DraftKings, you know, they spent, I forget the exact quarter last year, but they spent over $200 million in a single quarter on customer acquisition. Now, you know, what does that look like in terms of lifetime value? Um, gets better as you move up that chain from DFS to online sports betting to iGaming. So that'll be kind of critical there. So marketing is one, but but that's not really a particularly a moat, but it does, I would say, benefit you know, the larger players who are more well capitalized, who have more access to capital. There's no doubt about that. I think everyone would agree. You know, we talked about market access, but like that's a that's a really big, you know, player here. Like you can't you can't acquire users in a certain state if you don't have a relationship, if you, if you don't have an entrance into that state. But that that's kind of an aside. I think the other things I'd highlight, and this comes back to the marketing standpoint, are kind of these creative bets that are, are being offered uh, in a lot of cases, promos. Um, but if I look at, for example, like what Penn has done, leveraging the personalities that they have in Barstool, creating bets and narratives around those individuals is something that even DraftKings can't, can't try and, and replicate per se. So I think that that's another one that kind of is like creative uh, uh, bets. Um, another one would be, you know, the actual lines that they're offering, right? You know, can I get uh, you know, if I'm betting, you know, XYZ baseball game minus 110 on DraftKings, can I get it at a better uh, payout to me on FanDuel? And they're always going to be competing um, on that basis. And, and, and then I think the last thing kind of related to that is really the tech that these, you know, parties employ. A lot of the, a lot of the platforms run on different B2B operators that are in the, in the space that kind of operate the back ends for these platforms. So, in those cases, using you know Penn as an example, Penn and Rush Street, Rush Street Interactive both operate uh, off of a B two B platform called Canby, right? So the the lines and the the spreads for the you know, traditional games in there are going to be really really similar. The interface is going to be really really similar. Then it becomes marketing. But with all of this, I think we're going to see more in terms of technology emerge that allows for these players to kind of differentiate from one another. 
You know, I look at a company like PointsBet, which a lot of people don't talk about because it's it's listed in Australia, but has a, a you know a strong growing presence here in the U.S. You know, they have built out what's called points betting, which is like a totally unique way of betting to them, which is basically like leverage, for lack of a better to give a market analogy, um, on the way you can place bets. They just hire they just aqua hired this firm firm of quants. Um, so different companies are trying to get edges in terms of the the, the back end technology. What are the what are the types of bets they can offer to to users to kind of differentiate from one another. But coming back to the very beginning, I think still where we are right now, it is a it is a marketing game, it is a user acquisition game, and that benefits the larger players. Got it. Before we get, I do want to touch on the B2B side of this because I do think that's really interesting and kind of the highway of information that needs to flow to these sports books um, for, for it all to kind of happen seamlessly for consumers. Uh, but before we get there, I wanted to touch on one thing that you said, and that was in terms of around Barstool and the personalities and this idea that, you know, these sports books are going to integrate more and more with the content side of, of kind of the sports ecosystem in like an ESPN or, or, or one of these platforms that run highlights after highlights after highlights. You can start right now seeing on ESPN, right? There's gonna, there's like a little ticker tape at the bottom showing kind of the spread on each game. They have now new new kind of highlights and, and sessions there. Um, Barstool has done this in an amazing way. But how do you think that that is factoring into kind of the long-term vision of sports betting and then maybe we'll talk about this after but like the live the live aspect of sports betting i think feeds very well into that idea of like content and and kind of keeping the user engaged not just during the game but then after um, getting you excited more interactive oh i mean that's a hundred percent part of part of the story here i mean if you think about it it's kind of amazing that we've come that far in a couple of years that mainstream uh you know linear broadcasts of, of sporting events are now showing spreads and, and betting odds on their broadcast versus a couple of years ago, you'd get like a rare slip from Al Michaels on Monday Night Football when he, you know, alluded to something that he shouldn't have. And that was the extent of it. And everyone laughed it off. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. And I think it speaks to kind of the belief in, you know, sports betting and more specifically mobile and online sports betting as being kind of the, I don't want to say savior, but like the carrot that's going to right the ship for live traditional sports with a younger audience in Gen Z and millennials that has very low attention spans, that is accustomed to things like playing video games where they have agency, where they're involved, engaging in social media, where it's about, you know, being part of being interactive with the types of forms of media you're engaging with. Like sports leagues, media companies are all realizing that that is going to be absolutely critical to their long long-term success. And it's simply going to get integrated more and more into broadcast. Beyond that, you know, we talked about Barstool Pen, and you know, what I think one thing that's interesting there is, you know, they've basically been able to, rather than commit the type of marketing spend that DraftKings does, they're able to acquire customers via this kind of more organic social media uh, type type approach. But you know, large large uh, you know media companies have made investments into sports betting, right? NBC owns a stake, four four point nine nine percent stake in in points bet. Fox has an option to buy a large stake in, in the parent of, of, of FanDuel. Um, you know, these partnerships are being formed and they kind of haven't gotten to the point where they're fully fledged quite yet. But no, I mean, they, like everyone sees the writing on the wall. Viewership is declining. How do you bring that back for something like, you know, baseball, which is long and slow and doesn't really appeal to this younger demographic? And I think that segues really, really nicely into your next question about kind of live betting and what that could mean. You know, I think for a sport like baseball, if I can get to the point where a sports book is offering me, you know, the ability to bet on whether the next pitch is going to be a curve or a fastball or a strike or a ball, that could save baseball. Like, like, <laughs> let's call it what it is, right? Like, am I going to watch a four-hour baseball game? Well, like, maybe I'll watch the last inning, but maybe I'll watch the first eight too if I can, you know, bet a dollar here and there on on what's going on. I think it's a, a good time to kind of just give like the in-house view at ARC on, you know, why we've become so interested in the online sports betting space. And I think it's really, it comes down to matching kind of supply and demand, right? So if you think about sports betting as a way to just directly monetize a broader 
user base, then you know I think it's a really efficient way to do that. So if I you know one example we've thrown out kind of in our internal discussions, right, is if you had someone in uh, in California who's a New York Giants fan, and they you know if they lived in the state of New York, New Jersey, and were you know within driving distance to to go to those games, they'd probably be a season ticket holder. But they're not, right? They're they're in California. But that spend is something that they would have you know you know, put out there. Well, what's the next best way to kind of get that same feeling of being at the stadium, being in that social interaction, having kind of more engagement in the actual live event? Well, I think sports betting offers that avenue. Um, and so when we look at this, it's it's about more efficiently matching that demand curve uh, uh, for, for consumers and, and a way to really make you feel like, you know, you're a part of this experience. The same way when you walk into a stadium, you know, that's how you, you kind of get that same sensation to a certain degree. Um, it's different from everyone, but I think you know that's really what it comes down to, and it becomes a social event in, in nature, right? You 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 don't you you rarely find people just kind of doing this by themselves. It's usually you know they're talking with their friends, their groups. That's why Barstool has been able to capitalize on this, right? You want to bet with those influencers. You want to follow Dave Portner. You want to follow Big Cat, right? And so I think that's a really important piece to this idea, and that's why you know when you think about kind of the broader space. The leagues themselves are in a, an amazing position to kind of capitalize this and, and, and open up new revenue streams if they're willing to adopt this to, to a, a broader degree. Do you have any thoughts there in, in terms of like league adoption? Can we see like leagues more, I guess, better insert themselves into the entire ecosystem? We're starting to see it in a small degree, like indirectly, right? Like, I don't know if you caught this. Um, I think it was last week at this point, but, you know, the NFL... Uh, you know, moved away from Sport Radar, just signed a really big deal uh, with Genius Sports for the data licensing agreement. The main use case of that data licensing is for sports betting. And I think we've also seen Roger Goodell really change his stance and kind of allude to the fact that they're embracing it. We're also starting to see, you know, in, in certain stadiums throughout uh, throughout the country, actually betting kiosks in stadiums. So I think uh, Capital One Arena in DC was the first to do this with a William Hill, you know, sports betting kiosk set up in the stadium. I think they're definitely gonna gonna embrace it. It comes back to the same reason the media players are, are doing doing a, a kind of taking a similar approach to this. I guess the the question becomes for the leagues and for these large media companies is how do you do this in a, in, in kind of a responsible way that encourages you know safe and responsible gambling, and on top of that you know do it in a very ethical way where it's 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 hands off because it, it becomes tricky to kind of manage those you know different roles, uh, I guess, in terms of, you know, who has a different piece of the pie. I guess this is a good time to segue into the B2B side, because you had mentioned Sports Radar, Genius, um, kind of the data, the data end of this, you know, whole ecosystem. How is the best way to kind of think about, you know, the different players here, right? We talked about the, the sports books operators, the one that you would actually, or most consumers would actually be interfacing with uh, when they're, you know, making this bets. But then you have this second layer, kind of the back end, every, you know, all the nuts and bolts um, happening behind the scenes. How, how is the best way to structure kind of uh, a line of thinking thinking when, you know, you're, you're talking about the B2B side? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think a lot of the, the brands that, you know, everyone will likely interact with if they haven't already or, or kind of have heard of are the B2C players, right? It's FanDuel, it's Barstool, it's DraftKings, it's BetMGM, et cetera. Um, but the question is like, who's powering the, the back end? And, and the way I kind of view it is, you know, analogous to, you know, buying chip makers as a picks and shovels play on, you know, compute power or, or something alongside of those lines, you know, what we, what we don't really quite know, particularly in the U.S. market, I think things are a lot more mature in other markets, and we can touch on that if you'd like. In the U.S. market, we, we kind of know who the top couple winners are likely to be, but we don't know for sure. And I think in that sense, you can invest in these B2B players that um, service various uh, you know, B2C operators as a way to kind of play simply like top line growth in wagers and turnover and sports betting at, at a really high level without knowing if it's going to be FanDuel or DraftKings in a certain state or, or at, at the, you know, at the country level. Um, and I think there's kind of two types of players that are emerging. There's what you just touched on, Sport Radar, Genius Sports, that are focused on very particularly on the data side from the uh, leagues and are kind of that intermediary between the leagues and, and the sports book providers. And then you have company, uh, you know, and a lot of these are not listed in, inside of the U.S., uh, but you have Cambi, uh, you have Evolution that have really built interesting technology that they're then licensing to these operators because you know it's it's easier for them 
to kind of, rather than build their own tech, uh, to work with one of these third party providers. Um, and it, in similar vein, uh, you know, DraftKings as part of the SPAC go public deal did acquire their own backend tech, right? They acquired SB tech. And I think that that was probably a very strategic move for them to kind of, you know, reduce their costs and in-house where they can. Um, that being said, still a lot of the operators out there don't have that flexibility. So they're working with these B2B uh, providers. That's interesting. And so, yeah, you mentioned kind of where we've only touched on the U S right. But, you know, sports betting, this is a global or could be a global story. Um, it, it is in certain parts of the world, but it's not opened up everywhere. And certainly the U S has probably the strongest calendar season for sports, right? We have four major sports. Most, most countries do not have that. So you'd expect that the U S kind of shapes up to be one of the largest players in the world in terms of total, total betting figures. Um, but what, where are other countries where you've kind of noticed interesting stuff happening in the sports betting space? I think I would agree. It's definitely the largest opportunity um, that's out there right now. But, you know, as we touched on the very beginning, it's still in the early innings. um, And there's still a lot of unknowns in exactly how big the market can become, uh, how it will shape out in terms of winners, losers, et cetera. You know, I look to two kind of, or three, I guess you could say, distinct markets that are examples of more mature online betting markets. One would be the UK. Uh, Another would be more broadly the EU. Um, And then thirdly, Australia. You know, Australia is really interesting because they by far and away have um, the highest in terms of like, you know, per capita spend uh, wallet percentage um, on gambling relative to to other parts of the world. But these are these are much more mature markets. You know, the these companies and I think this is important if you're investing in in the U.S. uh, in the space. These companies have proven profitability um, and have proven EBITDA margins and have proven FCF margins. If you want to kind of get a feel for what these businesses can look like at more maturity, um, you know, in the UK market, you know, the sport, it's interesting, the sports betting, um, online sports betting market is a little bit more top heavy in terms of, you know, how it shakes out in market share. If you look at online casino, if you look at iGaming, it's much more fragmented. There's rooms for kind of niche players to offer different kind of offerings that appeal to different, different users. Um, and then beyond beyond those those markets, which are very well established, and I should mention in in those in those markets, what we've seen is, you know, the two the two largest trends here are one regulation, and two is the shift from physical to digital. We have seen you know gross gaming revenue shift from physical casinos to I believe don't quote me on this I believe to the point where online is now actually larger uh, as a share than is physical brick and mortar. I believe in the UK. So we're getting to the point where that you talk, you touched on this, but like where that that physical is all going to shift online. Um, beyond those countries, we have Canada, which is ready to legalize or seemingly ready to legalize single event sports betting. Parts of Latin America, Brazil looks like it's it's potentially going to legalize sports betting. So this really is a, a global opportunity. And I think when you when you think about um, you know some of these companies that are operating in the U.S., some of their growth opportunities are actually going to be outside of the U.S. Um, and that's why, you know, when I try and think about, you know, how big this market can become, you have to look at the total, you know, global gambling gaming market, which is $500 billion in gross gaming revenues. And like, what, what are the opportunities from that to shift from, you know, 90% of that, let's call it maybe 85 is physical right now. What does it look like when that starts to shift towards being majority digital and who are those winners? Yeah, I think that, that the tailwind of physical to digital, right? Because, in most of these countries, you know, physical gambling is very much legal. It's it's widely accepted, but the digital aspect hasn't been hasn't been there before. And I think that that brings up an interesting point in terms of like the convenience factor around this, right? If I can just open my mobile phone or my device and and place my wagers instead of you know having to drive to a casino or, or go some go somewhere else, right? That does really offer a consumer a much more compelling experience in terms of just not having to leave your home to participate in this activity. No, to- totally agree. And I think fortunately, unfortunately, however you want to look at it, I think it's going to, you know, the casinos that are going to survive this are going to be the destinations, right? It's going to be Macau. It's going to be Las Vegas. The casino in upstate New York, like, I don't know, might be might be left left out in the dust. Right, right. Those ones that are seemingly like off the side of a highway around nothing else. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I would definitely agree with you there. The destination spots will probably prevail in all of this, but but the ones that are 
you know, out in the middle of nowhere probably are going to have a tough time. But that, you know, I think those are the casinos to really watch in terms of the partnerships you spoke of earlier, right? Because most operators, maybe you can touch on kind of the legality issues around or why we see so many or why we see sports books or online sports books partnering with casinos. That's, you know, because you have to have a, a physical presence in, in the state, correct? That's exactly right. And I think that's, you know, one thing that I think, you know, people like to point to when they look at Penn and their kind of presence, um, you know, on a re with their regional casino footprint in various states, that gives them kind of a, you know, a foot in the door with the state legislatures to get onboarded. You're exactly right, though. You know, terminology in the industry is called skins. So, you know, depending on the state, certain casinos will be allowed to offer skins to relicense and they'll collect revenues from this as well. So they're incentivized to do it. But basically, the idea is to kind of, um, you know, allow for these mobile only operators to get a foot into the market, typically just because of politics and bureaucracy and all this fun that happens at the state by state level. That's how it's set up. Um, once again, uh, depends on, on a state by state basis. But, you know, typically most gambling licenses are held by these, you know, legacy casinos that are op already operating in these states. And just by a function of that, that's prob probably more uh, due to the fact that it was easier to do it this way than, than anything else. That's how the, a lot of the mobile operators will get in. They'll form a partnership with the, the physical brick and mortar casinos that already have relationship with the state. The one thing I should mention for in, you know, investors or otherwise who are you know, reading the New Jersey report when it comes out each month is that as a result, you'll see the casino at the casino level you know, reporting the, uh, the handle, reporting the gross gaming revenues at the casino level. It's important to look under the hood and say, oh, that's FanDuel that, that has that skin through that, through that casino because of those partnerships. And I think, you know, when I was looking and so for everyone who's listening, we're, we're recording this the day after kind of New York legislation came out around online sports betting and reading through that, my head really just started to spin because of how much red tape and how many hurdles these operators have to jump through in terms of, you know, there's going to be two platform providers as of today, there's going to be, and each one of those are, are going to get four skins. And it's like, it's just, I'm so my head is spinning just looking at this and you know why not just go back and and kind of rewrite and just make this a very simple process if you really do want to collect these revenues at the at the state you know tax level just make this a much easier experience for these companies to 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 to, to operate in you're preaching the choir like it, it's so the, the new york one is notoriously hard to understand like what's the difference between a platform operator and a, and a, and a skin in that case couldn't tell you um i will mention that important uh, particularly for you know a few of the big four that are out there california and florida namely you do get into it's politics again right and you know tribal casinos that have relationships with the state that are guaranteed certain portion of tax revenue so it's it's never as easy as what's probably the the most logical you know free market uh outcome here but that's why it's really important to kind of you know understand devils in the details for each operator and at each state level i think we talked a lot about this and i think we could probably do a whole nother podcast on just kind of the state level all of the the legislation legislative work that has gone into this and, and getting to this point today. But just getting back to, I, I, I really do think the content side and kind of the, the experience around integrating sports books into one single screen, if that would ever come up in terms of like being able to watch a, a an NFL game and, you know, you kind of have off to the side, the, the running lines throughout the game, like how far away are we from that experience? Or is uh, maybe like the other way to think about it is you, you're watching the game on a screen and you're actually placing most of the bets on, on your you know mobile phone or your laptop, whatever you're using in that, in that current state. How should consumers kind of think about five years out in terms of the integration of sports betting with the actual gameplay? of kind of the whole, the overall ecosystem. You know, live betting exists now, right? It's not maybe where it could eventually become, but you know, if there's a timeout and you want to bet on a team in the middle of the game, you can certainly do that. Um, but I think that, you know, what you're touching on is kind of this integration of, of betting being you know, becoming, I don't want to say the primary reason for people watching you know, sports on, on television, but, but almost, and what that could look like through a smart TV where you're, you know, placing your bets, you know, with your remote. I mean, I think part of that is just going to take time in terms of, you know, this question of mainstream acceptance, right? 
Um, and, you know, I think it's really interesting, you know, I look at the Amazon uh, deal that was just signed with Thursday Night Football, uh, for, which will be kind of the first ever, you know, exclusive for the NFL on a streaming platform. And immediately where my mind goes is what they've been able to do with Twitch and make that interactive um, and what that could mean for kind of a deal like that if you had a Twitch-like platform and the ability to kind of write from your, your computer or even from your phone bet at that at that level. I mean, that's where we're gonna, gonna end up and taking it with live betting like we talked about is gonna take that to a totally new level. I also think that this could expand beyond what we think of as sport, right? Like to what degree, I don't know to what degree there's interest and maybe this is a bad example because I think they pre-record it, but could I be watching The Bachelor and place a, a, a bet on what will happen next? Like, like, or watching a, a presidential debate and who's going to say what word next, right? Like, these are things that people like to like to bet on. So I think that that's like, you know, kind of, uh, you know, potentially where this is going. You know, I will say that for those players to really get involved, like in Amazon, it needs to be worth their time. And I think that we will get to a point where, you know, they're willing to make the commitment to invest further into this. And the way we've seen the deal structured right now, really important to note, is that, you know, these large media companies, Fox, you know, NBC, they take below 5% stakes. And they do that structurally because once you go above 5%, you're regulated. You're a gaming operator now in the world, in the you know eyes of the legislature. So that next step is going to happen. And we're gonna I'm I'm pretty sure we're gonna see, you know, some of these companies exercise their options. Say NBC is now a regulated gaming operator, because that's how we you know make a ton of money. I think we will get there. One thing we didn't touch on that I think is, you know, another leg of this, but somewhat tangential is kind of the viewing experience from home. We haven't really seen this, but like when I look at, there's some tech out there where you're seeing VR applications for sitting courtside at an NBA game. Like if you can, if you can make it like a full game, like it feels like you're playing a game and now you're betting on it and that's the game. Like there's tremendous like applications here. It's just, we're moving really quickly, but also, you know, like I said, two years ago, this wasn't, you know, three years ago, we weren't even legal. So it's going to take some time. There's two last pieces. One, the esports side of this. And I think you kind of hit on that with the VR experience, right? You could, there's going to be whole applications in kind of that realm. But then the other side, when you mentioned, you know, the Amazon deal with, with the NFL and what, I guess, viewing sports will look like in the future i'm so optimistic that once like we tear down kind of the old legacy system and and broadcast and linear um and you have these you know tech centric companies like amazon come in and and operate actually at the the rights level for for viewing um we're going to see so much more innovation happening right the one i i talk about this all the time when this gets brought up right i want to be able to watch i'm a diehard you know new york yankee fan i want to be able to watch a new york yankee game against the boston red sox and be able to choose my announce my announcers, right? I want to be able to pick and choose who is going to be announcing that game. Like I want a diehard, you know, New York Yankee fan in the same booth as someone who's a diehard Red Sox and they're going at it. And this this whole new experience I think opens up once you kind of leave the old world and come into this new tech centric world. I know the rights and there's so much legality in on that side, right? But then once you factor in kind of the the sports betting and and everything there, the the viewing of of sports is going to just continue to optimize to to a I think it's going to rebound really sharply because a lot of these leagues are seeing low re- viewership and it's not just last year, it's been for consecutive years now. You've seen declines in viewership. And I think they do need to make that change at some point and I'm I'm really hopeful that it happens soon. Yeah, totally agree. Um, you know, I think it's hard to kind of uh conceptualize um these kind of tech enabled uh viewing experiences that are that are going to come, but um, definitely believe that as more kind of tech oriented players, uh, including a- the likes of Amazon, uh, make their way into to broadcasting that, you know, the sky's kind of the limit in terms of what could come and betting is going to be an important part of that. Absolutely. And so just to, to wrap up here, you had hinted at, you know, some of the numbers in 2020 and, you know, talked, we kind of talked around this idea of, you know, this is a very large market, but let's just, you know, let's put this to bed. How, how large is this market going to be? Um, long term, and you know what are kind of yeah your most optimistic scenarios here? So I think you know in terms of handle once again the amount of wagers in the U.S. alone we're talking about hundreds of billions of of, of wagers. Um, you know there's a few kind of ways to try and 
um, you know, back of the envelope estimate. Once again, when you're so early, there's only so many, you know, there's half the states, but some are really early on. It's, it's always a guessing game, but, but you kind of look at, you know, these, these mature markets that we talked about, Australia and the UK is kind of, as well as New Jersey, which, you know, we've gotten to the point in New Jersey uh, where we, cr we basically hit $1 billion wagered in a single month, which is like kind of insane to me. Now, keep in mind, that could be, that could be New Yorkers, not me driving over the border to, to do that, but that's certainly incorporated there. So you could kind of look at it two ways. One, percentage of, you know, personal consumption. You could just do it based on GDP, but kind of the, the, the rough numbers um, are somewhere in the range of, let's call it, you know, 40 to let's call it 30 to 40 billion um, in terms of uh, U.S. online sports betting. Um, you know, and what I gaming year is that? What year is that? That's, you know, at full legalization, which, you know, do we ever get Utah? I don't know. How much does that move the needle? Hard to say. And I think full legalization, it's probably safe to say, which is in somewhere in the next 10 years, uh, I think is, is, is cons you know, I don't want to say conservative with anything polit <laughs> political because who the heck knows. But I think that's where we could be. Um, you know, Goldman actually pegged it at the high end of that range. So they said 39 billion. Um, for is that only... revenue or handle? That is revenue. That is revenue. revenue. Yeah, because so they... I was going to say, we have an internal yeah. number at in, in 2025 of around $180 billion in total wagers. So this would be that handle number. Got which it. breaks okay. down to some, you know, to a little lower than that. But yeah, agree. Yep. So that would be that would be in revenue, like a remarkable number. And you know, iGaming it depends on where you look. DraftKings has a number that's somewhere you know similar to that. You know, Goldman came out recently and said they see it at 15 billion. The thing is with iGaming, and I know this, we're really more focused on sports betting. With iGaming, it's so much more a question of which states actually legalize than the questions around the profitability and the revenue generated nature of it, because we know that that is in place. And just to give you context, like the the growth rate from where we are today at 1 billion ish. For U.S. online sports betting to get to that 30, let's call it 40 billion number within the next 10 years, is like roughly a you know 30 to 40 percent kager per year over a full decade plus uh, of time, which makes you know this market faster growing than anything we saw in you know, basically any market over the previous decade. So this will be, assuming legalization goes according to plan, one of the if not the fastest kind of you know sub segments within tech and 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 kind of um markets globally i i think i touched on this a little bit earlier but you know i think that you know when you look at on a global basis once again you need to look at the current tam of all gambling and, and that's 500 billion and like that is where you know i don't know what over time shifts to uh and that is in revenue once again not handled revenue. That is revenue yeah that so revenue. that's a mind-blowing number right there. yeah yes but only about 10, 15% of that is online right now. We're still super early in that taking place online. So can that become 50%? Can that become 75% where we're talking about only these experiential places uh, are getting the revenue? I don't know, but like it's it's just kind of, whenever I recite these numbers, even to myself, I'm like amazed at how, how big this is. And like, you know, even if you use conservative estimate, this is gonna be a very, very large market a very profitable market and 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 profitable for the states, which means that we're going to get more of them to kind of approve it uh, in the coming years here. And that, yeah, that $500 billion in total revenue is is really a, an amazing stat because going back to your prior comment and, and assuming, you know, iGaming and, and casinos have a bit of a higher margin here, but you're talking about, you know, double digit or low single digit or mid single digit kind of, you know, take off of that total wagering figure breaks down to that revenue number. So you're talking about $500 billion in revenue. You can just imagine how much money is actually changing hands in terms of total wagers bet. It's definitely a large market. And I, I do go back to this idea that in terms of what you were saying, right, this high, you know, 30 to 40% CAGR year on year. Well, that that is because you have so much pent up demand and the supply has been curbed because you have legalization standing in the way of consumers doing what they ultimately want to be doing and that is a convenient mobile betting experience, and it's taking time to roll that out. That's why you're going to see these high growth numbers for years, because you're going to have states roll out one by one, two by two, and eventually you get to this full legalization run rate um, where you know supply and demand are finally evenly matched. But until that time, you're going to see some mind-blowing, I think, growth rates across the board, which is just it's fascinating to watch play out. Totally agree. Yeah.
All right. Well, it was great having you on. We'll hopefully get you back on. Hopefully it won't be a, a full year. Last time we talked about online <laughs> gaming, this time online gambling. We're going to find something else in the <laughs> online realm to talk about you, uh, to talk with you about, but hopefully it won't go, we won't go a full year again. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on. This was a great, great uh, talk and conversation. I had a blast. Hope everyone listening did too. Um, and yeah, hope to see you soon. Thanks, Nick. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.